Hi, Russell. Hi. Is my voice? Yeah, yeah, you just take your mic. If it is audible. Is it? Okay. Is it good? Uh, can you speak something? Oh. One, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. Interesting. Is my voice quality good? Uh, yeah, but a bit louder will be better. A bit louder. Sure. Uh, uh, a bit louder. I want thank you very much for having me. Asasa, just check whether Rasul's voice is okay or not. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, Dr. Rasul. Very good morning. Your yeah, voice is uh, yeah. clear. No problem. Okay. Good. Sure. Great. Thank you very much. Durga sir also joined in. Sir, good morning, sir. Yes, uh, good morning, good morning. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Sir, Rasul also joined. Yes, yes, I am able to see. Good morning, Dr. Uh, yeah. I think you are on the phone with the speaker. Again? Asla, 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 asla. Oh, sorry, my Adam also. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Very good morning to all of you. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. With immense pleasure and pride, I, Dr. Santisur Basa, on behalf of Maharaja Sriramchandra Bhandeda University and the Department of Computer Science, welcome all the dignitaries and participants to the One Day International Conference on Recent Advances in Software Engineering Methodologies in Blended Mode. Now, 
let us begin our program by offering our humble prayer to the host. Start recording. Just a minute. Just a minute. Madam, see this is the recording. What is it? 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 Extremely sorry for the inconvenience. So now uh, let us begin our program by offering our humble prayer to the Almighty. Now I request uh, Ms. Sankamitra Swagraka to chant the welcome prayer before the Almighty. Swagraka, please. Thank you, Sri Now, uh, before 
I am going to introduce our honorable guests uh, to the audience. Let me very briefly say a few words about the basic objectives uh, of the conference. Uh, this conference will provide a forum for discussion on theoretical and practical aspects of advanced uh, software engineering methodologies, exchanging research ideas and challenges, exploring possible solutions and future directions. The conference mainly includes invited lectures on recent advances in software engineering, both from industry and academia. The invited lectures will mainly cover the uh, areas like uh, MCDC testing, conflict testing, modern based testing, object oriented testing strategies, AGI methodologies, white box and black box testing, etc. <coughs> now, it's my proud privilege uh, to introduce our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Kishore Kumar Basa, a well known academician of par excellence and a prolific researcher in the field of anthropology. Professor Basa had topped the matriculation examination in the state of Odisha in 1973 and later did his PhD from London University. He did his postdoctoral fellowship at Cambridge University. As an administrator, before he joined as the VC of the Vice Chancellor of this university, he was also director of Indira Gandhi Rashtriya Manav Sangrale in Bhopal, director of India Museum in Calcutta, and the director of the Anthropological Survey of India. Welcome you, sir, for this conference. For this conference. <coughs> Now let me take the opportunity to introduce our Chairman of the Council, Professor Anil Kumar Biswal, sir. Professor Biswal is a well-known botanist. His research interests include floristic studies, ethnobotanic botany, molecular taxonomy, and conservation biology. He is serving as an editor member and reviewer of several international reported journals. Professor Biswal is a member of many international affiliations. He has authored many research articles, books related to botany. Welcome, you, sir. May I now have the privilege to request our honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to deliver his inaugural address before the August gathering. Sir, please. No, I mean, would you not introduce your guest? Or you will do it Actually, later? Uh, consequently, when he is going to deliver that oh, talk. Okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, a very good morning to uh, all of you, ladies and gentlemen. In, it is indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me as Vice Chancellor to welcome you to this international webinar, uh, uh, international seminar in Blended Board on a very important theme, recent advances on software, in, software engineering methodologies. I think there cannot be a more opportune moment uh, than this to discuss on this uh, seminal theme. I am grateful uh, that uh, very reputed scholars uh, are joining and uh, uh, I'm sure our students and researchers and young faculties will derive uh, much benefit out of this uh, very <coughs> learned discourse today. Uh, I'm not a specialist uh, in this area, but uh, these days one cannot but uh, ignore the importance of uh, computer science uh, in general and software technology in particular, because uh, software technology perhaps is having an all pervasive uh, influence in the day to day uh, life of all, all of us. I mean, I, I was told. I mean, when I was uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD in the University of London in 1980s, at the time, the the buzzword was that the world is no long, no longer a class divided society. It is a digitally divided society. People are not talking in terms of uh, of, of class division anymore. People are talking in terms of digital division. How much people are computer literate in a in a society? Because uh, because this is uh, affecting, as I have said on the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life of each and every citizen of this world. The second aspect uh, is that I think pandemic has taught us that uh, we have to go much more than what we have been doing uh, in terms of healthcare, uh, in terms of day-to-day -day life, in terms of facilitating people when uh, markets are closed. Uh, we, have to, we have to develop so many aspects 
uh, which otherwise we might have missed in terms of the uh, in terms of the scope of, of software technology. Uh, the the last thing that I would like to say is that uh, uh, these days uh, the machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to be the uh, main focus in every branch of science. And here also, I think computer science uh, in general and software technology in particular will have great relevance. I think uh, in the next uh, 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 two decades, I think artificial intelligence is going to affect our day-to-day -day life in much more uh, intimate manner. Uh, it may be, so one has to be very careful in terms of its social consequences. For example, to what extent artificial intelligence uh, will be a substitute for, let us say, medical practitioners. Let us say day-to-day -day, uh, life. Uh, I mean, we are going to doctors for uh, certain uh, certain aspects, but then artificial intelligence can substitute much of, much of the job of uh, sort of general practitioners. So I am just giving an example, but I think such examples will be uh, more uh, uh, more and more in time uh, in time to come. And and in that context also, uh, I think one has to develop software to uh, to 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 uh, to aid uh, the hardware. Uh, I'm not a, as I have said, I'm I'm not an authority on uh, on on computer science, but I am a, a user of computer science. I'm a user of uh, software. So. Apart from the importance of software in researches, apart from the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, apart from the use of software in, let's say, let's say these days, what we, what we call the big data analysis, for example, big data analysis, software is coming in a big way. So I think uh, software is going to be, it has become, and going, uh, it has become an inseparable part of contemporary human existence. I think it is going to be more and more important in days to come. But my only worry is uh, uh, whether, in terms whether uh, by use of software and by use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we, we are substituting uh, the human work by machine work. It is fine. That is that, that's a very good way of saving a lot of time. But one has to whether it is a slight worry uh, to what extent uh, this artificial intelligence would intrude into the personal and social life of people as a whole and what social cost one has to pay, uh, I think one has to also uh, think of those aspects. By this, I am not trying to make you depressed uh, about the future of uh, social implications of artificial intelligence. What I am just suggesting is that apart from the good qualities or the good aspects of software as well as artificial intelligence, we should also be conscious of the implications of the use of such technology, uh, because because as I said, a, a society uh, has to develop, it has to accept a technology. Technology, you know, all of us know that scientists develop technology, but then it takes some time by the society to accept that technology. But to our good luck, as far as software is concerned, I think the ex social acceptance of software is much faster than any other form of technology. With this. Uh, a general kind of statement. I have great pleasure in inaugurating this seminar, and I'm sure by this agacious uh, uh, lecture of our resource persons and invited speakers, I'm sure my faculty members, research scholars, and other young faculties or young students would derive much pleasure and knowledge out of it. I wish this seminar all success. I apologize. I apologize uh, to you that because of certain pressing engagement, I have to leave right now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my university. You are joining this this uh, this uh, seminar in a virtual board. We'll be more than happy if you could make, make it to our university at some point of time. We'll be very happy to welcome you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, to, to our campus. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for a patient hearing. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Or a, or a very, very, very informative and encourages, uh, uh, encouraging uh, talk. This, this will definitely encourage our students, students and participants. Thank, thank, thank you very much, sir. Now, now uh, may I take the opportunity to... Uh, request request uh, our chairman, chairman PG Council, Council sir, Professor Anil Kumar, Kumar Biswal, sir, to, to give a talk. talk. Sir, please. please. Hello, Pranam. Uh, good morning, one and all. 
ट्रैवलिंग टू भुवनेश्वर दैट इज टू हंड्रेड सेवेंटी किलोमीटर फ्रॉम आवर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑनरेबल बाइसंस प्रोफेसर किशोर कुमार बासा सर रेवर डॉक्टर आदम डायवेक डॉक्टर्स रसूल प्रोफेसर दुर्गा प्रसाद महापात्र डॉक्टर्स गोडबरे माइंडर कॉलेज डॉक्टर एस एस भाषा डॉक्टर एस के साहू एंड माइंडर स्टूडेंट्स ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ चेयरमैन पीच काउंसिल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ माई यूनिवर्सिटी आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू दी इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार actually i could have enjoy the entire speak uh, speeches or deliberations if i could was in a static position as i am moving i am unable to enjoy the entire program till then i will try my best to join from time to time you know this is the age of information technology the whole world now is being monitored and dominated by technology like your information technology your biotechnology and so on and fortunately we are not lagging behind our department of computer science in the university and the faculty members are trying our best to provide such opportunity to our students and faculty you know for this particular purpose they have invited you people for interacting with your students and to share the basketball knowledge with our students for the particular program i would like to on me my, my grateful acknowledgments for accepting my our, our invitation and to share their valuable time for benefit of our students and faculty once again i welcome all of you now i hand over the microphone to dr basa dr basa please once again thank you all thank, thank you very much sir for an uh, encouragement speech thank, thank you sir, sir. Now, now may I request uh, to professor durga prasad mahapatra sir to uh, speak a little uh, very few words uh, regarding the conference thank you professor basa so honorable uh, vice chancellor vice uh, chancellor sir uh, pd council chairman professor biswal Uh, my dear uh, colleagues dr radam dr rosul dr gurbale dr basa and all my dear uh, colleagues dear participants i am very happy that this uh, maharaja uh, what this university is organizing a, a conference an international conference on a, a very relevant topic uh, which is very much important nowadays we will discuss all those details uh, in the uh, my session but you see now the software engineering has played taken A very important role in the current days. As the honourable business are as I already told, you are developing a software, but at that time you have to keep in also mind the hardware. Mm -hmm. See, you are developing. Uh, see, uh, what is software? We must have to take into account uh, what kind of hardware you are using. You are all are you are using my what your uh, mobile phones. So the same software, same operating system which are you using in your what uh, desktops or laptops. may not be suitable for your uh, what um, these kind of embedded systems such as mobile phones or your microwave or refrigerator every everywhere you will find in software software but depending upon 
the nature of the hardware, the environment. Accordingly, also we have to customize the software. So that's why we are using Android, etc., for what mobiles. Whereas we are using other kind of Windows, Linux, etc., for our hard, uh, what uh, desktops and uh, laptops, etc. I'm coming to the field of software engineering. You know, whenever as a teacher or when your teacher is giving some assignment to develop a program, you just start writing program. Just to write, a, find out whether a number is a word prime or not, or even a word or things like that. You do not think directly write the software. But please see, when a bigger kind of software will be given to you, like railway reservation system, banking information system, you cannot simply write down the software directly, you cannot write down the code. I am giving a very typical example. So when you are telling a petty contractor, to what uh, build a one story or two story three story building he can do for you but when you will say that being a, what uh, develop a or construct a 50 story building or 90 story building 100 story building he will say either sorry i cannot do or if you will uh, what uh, you will say that uh, with uh, grave that i will do it then either that building will collapse or it will uh, completely fail because the Knowledge of the civil engineering, how to construct a building, what will the strength of these what beams, where the what beams will be positions, what will the ratio of this uh, what sand, uh, cement, uh, and this concrete, etc. He doesn't have idea. So he will prudently develop that uh, building or uh, construct that 100 story building, definitely it will collapse or it will just completely fail. So, similar kind of example you see. When you are taking, we are telling you as a student, develop a program for a, even uh, the, to check a number is even or odd or this uh, prime or not, you can easily directly start the writing the query. But when you say that, develop a software for railway reservation system, air flight reservation system, or banking system, you cannot do that. You have to follow a systematic procedure. You have to first, you have to first write down what is the requirement. You have to collect the requirement from the users. Then you have to design and you know the different design tools like data flow diagrams, UML diagrams, etc. Then you will go for coding, then testing, then maintenance, etc. So this systematic way of developing a software by using these principles we call a software engineering. If you will not follow the systematic way of uh, what, uh, dev uh, what uh, developing the software, then definitely the software will fail. So this is this shows the importance of software engineering. And there are different uh, areas, you know, as I have started from requirement analysis, coding, uh, then design, coding, testing, etc. So each page has some definite rule and the sequence of steps you have to follow. And you know that many of the softwares they fail. Why? Due to lack of proper testing. Also due to lack of proper understanding of the requirements. And you know, if the requirement specification is faulty, ultimately design will be faulty. What software code you will write, it will fall. It will be faulty. So we have to give much more attention, starting from the beginning, how you can correctly write down the requirements in the SRS document, how you can correctly design it, how you can then we can come to the coding, how you can correctly code, and then we follow the different testing techniques. So. Those uh, things, uh, I think I will take a topic on this importance of software testing in my lecture. There I will describe how to test the software, uh, how, how uh, what is the importance of software testing. We'll see some examples how due to small minor mistakes, you see several softwares have collapsed, they have failed, and uh, several lives have been lost, several crores of rupees have been lost. So those things will take up in my class. Um, so with the, this brief introduction to this uh, uh, importance of software engineering, I wish you a very happy um, uh, what uh, uh, success in this uh, workshop. I hope you will definitely enjoy in this software. And uh, my uh, the several international experts are also there, like Professor Adam, Dr. Rasul, uh, and they will definitely highlight some important topics. And I, I expect that you must enjoy out of uh, the deliverables or this uh, uh, what these lectures, the special lectures that will be delivered given in this uh, uh, conference. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basa, for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Now, now I request uh, Dr. Rasul kindly say a few words uh, about this conference. Dr. Rasul, please. Hi, hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Basa. Uh, it's a pleasure for me being here. And uh, uh, I would like to first to thank uh, the dear organizers of this uh, one-day conference. 
for all the efforts in organizing and also inviting me. And it's also a pleasure to see Dr. Uh, Professor Mahabatra and also Dr. Bhattali, uh, who is a former colleague of mine after a uh, long time. And uh, it is very nice that I think that in Indian universities and also industry, uh, software engineering practices are taken uh, very seriously. This is something which is quite important. And I think we need to give more attention to these people. And I hope in my talk today I can uh, present some of the newer techniques which are more uh, worked on at the academic side and on the research side. And I hope it will be informative and useful for the students. Well. Thank, you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Rasul. Now, now uh, may I request uh, Dr. Santosh Kumar Sahu uh, to give a formal vote of thanks. Sir, please. Very good morning uh, to all the eminent uh, uh, personalities present here. So, Honorable Bhaisanto Sir, Professor Kishore Kumar Basa, Honorable Chairman, DG Council, Professor Anil Kumar Bisha, respected colleague, Dr. Jivendra Kumar Mantri, today's resource persons, Dr. Rasul and uh, Dr. Kurbole, today's organizers, Dr. Santi Swarup Basa and Dr. Minaki. Today's uh, Honorable Professor, Dr. Dunga Prasad Mahapatra. So, we are really grateful to all of you who have made themselves available to grace our occasion. Recent advances in software engineering and technology is an excellent area to discuss because it is developing at a very high pace. So, and so is the ways to misuse it. So we must keep ourselves updated to handle these uh, I mean recent technologies so as to give the best of the benefits to the society. So it is my proud privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks uh, to everyone present in this meeting. So, so I am immensely grateful to our Honorable Bhaisanthu Sir, Professor Kishor Kumar Basa, who has usually, uh, I mean, very sincerely made himself available to inaugurate the seminar. I convey my regards to our Honorable Chairperson, Professor Anil Kumar Basa, uh, although he is at a, a great distance he has made himself available to grace the occasion. I thank our eminent resource persons, uh, Professor uh, Rasul uh, Magre and Professor Sangaratna Gurubole, who, has, uh, who have made themselves available to be present in the inaugural meeting. So I also uh, feel my great, uh, I mean, uh, my gratitude towards uh, Professor Durga Prasad Mahapatra, who has faced the occasion. And lastly, I thank our organizer, Dr. Santishwar Basa and Dr. Minaki, uh, who have taken a lot of uh, pain to organize this nice seminar. I also thank the students who are the workforce behind, behind organizing everything. So, so thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. uh, Professor Santosh Kumar Sahu, sir. Now, now we uh, move towards our first uh, technical session without any break because it's uh, we are all, already uh, running out of their, uh, out of time. So may I now the opportunity to introduce 
our today's speaker dr rasul dr rasul received his bsc honors from siraj university iran in 2005 and his phd from national university of singapore in 2017 he was a post doctoral research fellow at the school of computing national university of singapore from 2017 to 2020 his research interests are in programming languages and precise program analysis he has been utilizing program verification methods especially dynamic symbolic execution for precise research analysis the result of his research researches has been published in rts lcts icse and nfse conferences he was a research member working on the open source pressure x symbolic execution engine <coughs> recently he has joined why heterogeneous compiler lab toronto canada as a compiler software engineer Uh, thank you dr rasul for coming uh, for joining uh, in virtual mode to our conference welcome you again now may i take the opportunity to request you to deliver your talk dr rasul please thank you very much and good morning to everyone uh, let me share my screen uh can you see my screen Uh, please let me know if you can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, your organizers. My talk will be uh, mostly on uh, dynamic symbolic execution interpolation. This uh, has been the thing developed in our open source tool tracer. I will try to first go to some of the concepts, some of the background, and then uh, some implementation details in Tracer X. Uh, Tracer X uh, has been developed. Five minutes delay. Mm -hmm. Five second delay. Sure. So, yeah, so I see myself, uh, Dr. Okay. Uh, at the moment, are working on that project, and we are really interested if uh, other people uh, would like to join our team. And we hope that this would be a good start point to enhance the different things which are currently available on dynamic symbolic execution. So, uh, just as an introduction to Tracer X before, or I. Try to enter, uh, let's say, into some background and more details. Uh, in this talk, first, I'm introducing Tracer X's way of uh, approach of symbolic execution. Use different different uh, system level program. On top of, uh, in addition to C, Tracer X performs interpolation, uh, which I will let me carefully explain in later slides. But just to explain in short, using interpolation, we try to gather information from already diverse, uh, let's say, symbolic execution subtrees and use them to clone other subtrees. Uh, in with SpaceX, we were able to win the second uh, place in last year's RERS competition. We were using from SpaceX plus from C, which is a tool, you, uh, a static analysis tool uh, for unbounded program. And we were able to also, at the current moment, the best let's say, position that we have been able to get uh, has been the sixth place in test from. Uh, competition, and we hope with let's say further work we are able we will be able to get a third position in uh, let's say future competition. Now the website is in this address. The source code is also in this address. In case you are uh, interested in let's say uh, trying to research. Now let me start with some background. Uh, 
in general, if you want to compare verification versus testing, verification is unbounded. Dr. Rasul, please uh, excuse me. Your yes, voice yes. is uh, not clearly audible. Uh, oh, is it my voice uh, clear? I, I think it now. Uh, speak uh, uh, Russell, can you just um, um, microphone is with your webcam? That will be better. Can you just switch your microphone? Oh, okay. Uh, sure, sure. Let me try to see if I can uh, switch to the microphone of the system. Uh, or maybe just if you can give me one second, I'll try to bring another. Uh, sure, sure, sure. 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 Sorry for <laughs> no problem. Basa sir, my voice is audible, right? Yes, 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 very clear. Your voice is fully clear. No problem. <laughs> Sir, I have to go to the message. What is starting there for it? I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, I May I ask if my voice is clear now? Uh, no, Rasul, it is too soft. Uh, is it good now? Sorry, no, a little bit louder. Uh, how about now? Is it there now? Yeah. Uh, you are on mute, uh, Sangu. A bit more. Uh, is, is it there now? Yeah, yes. it's perfect. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry for this issue. And uh, okay, let me continue. Uh, is my screen shared at the current moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, um, let me continue with the background. I was saying that in comparison of verification versus testing, uh, verification can be used on unbounded programs. It gives you a complete answer, meaning that if it says a uh, program is safe, it is definitely safe. And uh, let's say we can use abstractions in verification, which allows, which helps us to prune the search space, which may, because usually the search space in programs are quite large. These are the pros of uh, verification. On the other hand, the cons is that uh, verification is not applicable usually on very large and complex programs. It might not be able to prove a program is safe or prove a program has a bug if the program is quite large. Or, and also it is an all or nothing, uh, let's say, uh, method, meaning that it would, if it, finishes and proves the program is safe, uh, we have a useful answer. But if it doesn't finish, we will get nothing. On the other hand, in te on testing side, testing has been uh, used effectively to find real bugs in large programs, and it allows us to precisely examine the traces. No abstraction is used in testing. Is a stop any time, meaning that we can run a testing method for some amount of time and then uh, see if we have any errors or not. So even a partial, let's say, execution of a testing tool it would be helpful. 
and it can be uh, run on uh, large and complex programs. On the other hand, testing has a few issues. One issue is that it should be only executed on a bounded program. So for example, if on a program, I have, let's say, a sorting algorithm, which I'm testing it with uh, array size 100, that doesn't mean that that program is safe for a hundred, uh, let's say, array size 150, for example. There might be a bug in, uh, let's say, sizes 120 and upwards, which I might miss. On the other hand, we cannot use any abstractions, which means that we cannot have any pruning. And as you know, the number of possible uh, test inputs which we can provide the program is exponential. On the other hand, uh, this part you might not completely agree with me. Uh, the point that mm, whether a test, whether testing can have a poor path coverage or a good path coverage. At the current moment, we have uh, a smart fuzzing tools which are quite, uh, let's say, uh, good. And if you look at the last year and the last two years tests on competitions, the winners have been fuzzing tools, meaning that they have been better than, let's say, symbolic execution tools or other tools which have been used for testing. But on the other hand, we, uh, let's say, in Tracer X, as I will show later in this talk, we have shown that for very difficult bugs, meaning that bugs that are very, mm, let's say, uh, only a very small number of, let's say, uh, inputs would lead to the bug. These fuzzing tools might not be that much effective. So in, when dealing with, let's say, very difficult bugs, uh, testing approaches might not be the best option. Now, in the next, let's say, in the third part, I would like to speak about symbolic ex exploration, meaning that symbolic execution either with or without interpolation. Uh, symbolic execution can verify a program, meaning that if, if, it's, if it is possible for you to explore the whole search space, it can perform verification, and it can also find real bugs. So it has kind of the pros from both sides above. We are able to do precise ex examination, on symbolic traces, unlike testing, which we have, we have to do it on, uh, let's say, uh, concrete traces. Uh, there is one point that symbolic exploration tools like CLI, which do not use any abstractions, uh, cannot finish exploring the symbolic execution tree on large programs. And this is the place that kind of TracerX can be helpful. In TracerX, we provide interpolation for lossless abstraction. And also, we can have light, we can introduce a lightweight user abstraction, and we can potentially uh, expand symbolic exploration to unbounded programs as well. But it requires some extra work like mathematical induction, which will be out of the scope of this talk today. Now, uh, before continuing, I would also like to mention as a background the difference between static and dynamic symbolic execution. In dynamic symbolic execution, uh, the execution space of the program, as I will show in the later slides, is explored path by path. The key advantage, there are two key advantages. The first one is that uh, since we are looking at one path at a time, the analysis can be quite precise and efficient. On the other hand, the second one is that we can have a choice of search, search strategy. We can do a depth first, breadth first, or random path exploration. And this can be helpful for different uh, programs. The key disadvantage is that DSE is unguided, unguided meaning that uh, we have an exponential number of paths in a program. And if we do not apply any pruning, uh, let's say, technique, uh, the exploration would never finish. And it would take a very long time to finish in practice. On the other hand, in symbolic execution, symbolic, uh, static symbolic execution, or SSE for short, uh, the program, the whole program, 
is compiled into a logical formula. And then that logical formula is passed to an assembly solver to do a satisfiability checking. If the assembly solver is returning a yes, means that the program is safe with respect to that, to the, uh, let's say, uh, safety property that we were checking. If it says no, it provides a counterexample. Uh, sim static symbolic execution is also known as bounded model checking. Uh, the key advantage is that in static symbolic execution is that we can use the pruning which is used in the underlying SMP solver uh, algorithms and in order to prune the search space. So uh, this would be based on, on SAT core algorithm, which I will explain in later slides. Uh, as a result, we can kind of say that BMC or uh, SSE is some sort of guided symbolic execution, unlike the previous slide, which was unguided. On the other hand, the key disadvantage is that, mm, let's say, everything is static. So we cannot have a path by path consideration over here. We should know how many times loops are, uh, let's say, uh, what is the loop bounds up front. And this might not be possible for every program. And as it has been shown in previous years, uh, BMC tools have not been, have been performing better on the verification competitions, not on the testing competitions. Now, uh, in Tracer X, what we are interested to do is that to perform dynamic symbolic execution, plus having the pruning technology, some sort of pruning technology, similar to what is used in SMP solvers. So we kind of would be able to have the advantages of both static and dynamic symbolic execution. So in the rest of this talk, what I will mm, explain would be, uh, firstly, I will explain how interpolation would help us to mitigate the search complexity. Uh, then I will go into the interpolation algorithm of Tracer X in detail. We have two different interpolation algorithms uh, in Tracer X, which I will explain them one by one. Uh, this memory bounded interpolation I'll just show and similarly keep, I will kind of more or less have to skip them. Sorry, I should have removed them from the outline and then I will go to uh, the results section. Now, uh, just um, to re, re um, mention what we are trying to do is that we, in symbolic execution, in dynamic symbolic execution, uh, which we use in TracerX, we are exploring every path, the paths in a program one by one. And as I explained, we have exponential number of paths. Now, how we can address this huge uh, search space, which is exponential in the size of the program, just to explain how large a program can be, Assume a program which has a loop of 100 iterations. Inside the loop, you have a simple if statements where uh, you have a true branch and a false branch. Now, this program would have two to the power of 100 paths, which is quite large. And it would take a very long time for a symbolic execution tool to explore. What we do is that when we explore a group of paths, which we call a subtree inside the symbolic execution tree, we try to learn something and use that of what we have learned, which we call the interplan, to prune another part of the symbolic execution tree, which would be another, let's say, group of paths. And this is kind of the key thing that we have in symbolic execution with interpolation. Now, as an example, consider the program that we have over here. And, and this program, initially, let's assume x is greater than zero. We have three if statements in the true branch, uh, let's say shown with one, uh, program points one, three, five. In one of them, we just do a skip. In the other two, we are um, setting c to zero and increasing the value of x. And we have also, uh, let's say, the conditions are on A, B, and C, and quite a simple program. Uh, let's assume uh, the symbolic execution tree of this program. It has eight paths, as you can see over here, 
the path where a, um, let's say initially x is greater than zero, the path where a is equal to one and the path where a is not equal to one, then again b equal one, b not equal to one, and c equal one and c not equal to one. As you can see, sorry, there are eight paths over here. Now, in this program, how symbolic execution, this thing over here is called the symbolic execution tree. And how we explore a path in this symbolic execution tree, let's say, let's assume the leftmost path is explored, the green path over here. As we continue through the paths, we start collecting constraints. So initially, uh, we have x0 greater than 0, we, then we add a0 equal to 1, then we add b0 equal to 1, then we add c1 equal to 0, and at this point we have a test, this c1 equal to 1 is in this, let's say, part of the if statement. Now, uh, this part of the if statement over here. Now, and then the continuation of the path. So this is called the trace, we keep the information of the constraints across the path and we use version variables to differentiate between the variables if a variable is reassigned, let's see. Like the case over here where x1 is assigned to all variable x plus 1. Now, this path over here, if we come over here, this path is an infeasible path. What we mean by infeasible path means that there is some, let's say, the constraints that we have collected up to this point do not satisfy this new constraint that we were trying to collect. So C1 is equal to zero. When we try to go to this path, C1 cannot be equal to one. So this path, we, I showed with this red X, this is an infeasible path. Now, we, the exploration of this path finishes over here and we switch to the second path at this point and we can continue the path over there. Now, this process should go continue path by path till the end of the symbolic execution tree. As you can clearly see, the number of paths can be quite a lot. Now, where does interpolation come into the picture? The interpolation is important when we try to prune some tree within the symbolic execution tree based on the information that we have gathered from another subtree in, in, in the tree. So this, in the, let's say, subtree below 2 versus this subtree below 2. Let's assume we have explored these four paths, and now we try to uh, infer the safety of this second subtree from the exploration of the first subtree. Let's say in this... Uh, program, we are trying to prove that x0, which was equal to, uh, greater than 0 in the beginning, still holds in the end of the program, meaning that at, at the end of every path in this program, still the value of x is greater than 0. Now, in this exploration, what information should be, let's say, uh, kept, uh, kept or stored from the exploration of the left subtree in order to, for us to be able to infer the correctness of the right subtree. Uh, this information would be kept as an interplant. We have a path interplant and a tree interplant. The path interplant is the information that we collect from one path. And this information can be a path-based weakest precondition, which would be the best interplant. I will explain later more in detail. Or it can be based on ANSAT core, which I will explain now. This ANSAT core is our first method of interpolation, which is quite similar to the method used in SMT solvers. Now, we also have the tree interplant. The tree interplant is usually, a combina uh, let's say, generated by combining the path interplants and generating one uh, tree, and it is kind of an interplant for a subtree. And it is very important to uh, obtain a compact representation. So, for example, the constraints in the leftmost path that we saw over in the previous slide are these, from program point zero to program point six. Now, which of these constraints are important and which ones are not important? This path was infeasible. We have to record the point that the path was infeasible. If you look at these constraints, 
only c1 equal to 0 and c1 equal to 1 is important. The rest of the constraints are not important, meaning that they are, if I remove them, still the path would remain infeasible. This can be computed using unsat core. What unsat core does, unsat core is a well-known kind of uh, algorithm in uh, dealing with logical formulas and constraints, meaning that if I have a set of constraints which is unsatisfiable, what is, what is the smallest subset of those constraints which still would keep the uh, constraint unsatisfiable, which would be in this case these two parts over here. And these two are in the information that we will keep from exploration of this path. Now, as we continue, let's say, and let's assume that we have explored this subpath and we have collected some information, and when we go to the second let's say, uh, subtree, we would use that information, meaning that we would check that the information that we did collect from the uh, exploration of all the paths over here, was it enough to uh, subsume the second uh, Let's assume that only the, mm, let's say, uh, every constraint which is has a line below it is underlined, is not important to ensure the safety of this uh, condition. And the ones which are not underlined are the ones which are important. Let's say in this case, x0 greater than 0 is important because it is, for these three paths, it is important to keep this. And the reason is that it is important for, uh, for us to know that x0 was greater than 0 to be able to show that in the at the end of these three paths we have x greater than zero and uh, let's say this x1 equals x0 plus one is again important but this uh, let's say for example b constraints on b is not important the constraint on a is not important this constraint on c1 is also important because it is the reason for the infeasibility of this path so more or less i'm trying to explain what constraints we keep, what constraints we throw away. And let's say if I go to program point two and from the beginning of the program to this program point two, we have only two constraints. This x zero greater than zero and this a zero equal to one. One of them is important, the one on x zero. One of them is not important, the one on a. Now, when I go to the second program point two in the similar equation tree, I will compare the constraints. Over here, the constraints is x0 greater than 0 and a0 not equal to 1. And the information which is required for me to ensure the safety of this subtree is only x0 greater than 0, which is shared in the two paths at the current moment. So I can easily subsume the second subtree with the first one and prune all the paths below it and infer their safety. Now, without interpolation, I should have explored two, twice the number of paths, and this will grow exponentially. While with interpolation, I can, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, subsume and uh, explore less. Let me go through the detailed steps of how we compute the interplan in this example. So we have the first path, as I explained for you, and let's say we we underline the important constraints so the first path is infeasible as i just explained c1 and c uh, the two constraints on c1 are kept the rest can be uh, let's say forgotten about this would be the path interplant if i now switch to the second path in the end of the second path x is still greater than zero so the path is safe there is no kind of errors at this point in the exploration. Now, this time, the only constraint which is important is this x0 greater than 0 for the second path. Now, using these two path interplants, I combine them and I compute the tree interplant. In the tree interplant, this constraint is important, this constraint is important, and that's it. Now, when I go to the next path, uh, over here, I have a program point over here and I have a program point four over here. I can compare and see if I can prune this one with the other one, but I cannot do that because 
one of the constraints which is important is C1 equal to zero, which is missing on this side. So I cannot, uh, um, let's say, prune the second visit to program point four. I have to go down again over here. This constraint is important. This constraint is important. And let's say if I go to the last path, similarly, this constraint is important. Now, using these two path interpunts, I create another tree interpunt for this subtree over here. And I can use these two, let's say, tree interpunts and convert them to a path interpunt for the two let's say, nodes below program point two. And then again, merge these two to create a tree interpunt for program point two. At program point two, looking, so the tree interpunt is always looking towards the up, uh, you, to the constraints which is above that node. It, the ones we below that node is not, no longer important. So looking at the top, we have two constraints. One of them is important, the other one is not important. So our interpunt is only x is zero greater than zero. And when we go to the second visit to program point two, now we can substitute. And this is uh, how we, uh, more or less the algorithm that we have used for uh, unsatisfiability core interpolation in tracer x. Now, this is a good point. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer before I continue on to more examples. Uh, please uh, let me know if you have any questions, otherwise I can continue. Okay, sure. Maybe let me continue with the uh, rest of the presentation. So, I, at, up to this point, I explained a very basic interpolation algorithm which, we, which was based on unsatisfiability core. Now let's go to a more, let's say, detailed example. Assume we have this program over here. P is, let's say, a allocation of size five. We have an if statement. The condition is not important. We increase P by one at one point and we increase P by two in the else branch. Now, after this if statement, we try to, uh, let's say, refer to the address which is stored in P. So, assuming that over here we were looking at P0, over here P is increased by one, over here is P, P increased by two, we want to prove whether this the reference is a safe memory access or not. Now, in order to do this, uh, let's say, this would be the symbolic execution tree. In the first true branch, we have P equals P0 plus one. And when we come to this point, which is in program point two, at the point of the reference, there are two possibilities. If the value of P1, what's in stored in P at this point, is less than the boundary of the array, which is P0 plus five, then the program is safe. If P1 is greater than this P0 plus five, this path would lead to an error. We have to show that this path is infeasible and the other path is feasible. So let's assume we have came down and we have done the exploration. If I, was, uh, if I were um, using an unsat core, uh, let's say interpolation and I would come compute the two path interpunts uh, from here and here, all the constraints which I have over here are important in to ensure the safety at, in this subtree. So I cannot remove any of them. I have to keep all of them. And when I go to the other side, the second time that we visit program point two, uh, since there's a difference in this constraint versus this constraint, I cannot use the pruning approach that I have and I cannot substitute. So this is just an example to show that the onset core pruning approach, which is used in both SMT solvers and in the basic algorithm that we have in Tracer X can easily not, easily not work in such a simple example. Now, the question is that what can I do to have a better interpret? And 
Mm, for that, I can come up with a slightly more a better approach, which we call it slacking. And this slackening is kind of the simplest case of uh, the second algorithm that I will be explaining, which is based on, on sad core interpolation. Uh, sorry, based on weakest precondition interpolation. Now, over here, we have two paths. The first path is safe, so I can just return true as the interplot, meaning that any condition, any set of constraints which goes through this path is safe because this path does kind of does not lead to an, any error situation. Uh, so as a result, the let's say inter path interplan would be true. Now the second path, if it's feasible, I would go to an error state. So I have to store an interplan a condition which makes sure that this path is infeasible. If I negate the condition over here, meaning that P1 less than P0 plus 5, as long as this condition is satisfied, this path is infeasible. Now, when I have this condition, although the value of P was P0 plus 1 in the common context, I have generalized it to P1 less than P0 plus 5, meaning that at program point 2, as long as P1 is less than P0 plus 5, the subtree is safe. So I can use this generalized information and when I go to the other side, and this is my, let's say, interpreter way here, I would be able to prune this second visit to program point 2. Since still this new condition, which is P1 equals P0 plus 2, satisfies the interplan that I had uh, computed from the previous uh, visit. Now, this interplan can be copied back again over here, and we would have two path interplans. And these two path interplans can be pushed to the parent node, which is program point one, and it would give us two updated constraints. The update on P1 over here is P0 plus one. So when I apply this change to P0 plus five, the, con the condition that I would, the constraint that I would get up here would be P equal P1 less than uh, P0 plus four. And the one that I would get from program point two and pass it up is P1 less than P0 plus three. So these are kind of the two path interplans coming from the two different program points. Mm, number two's two back to program point number one. And I can simplify them into this one, P1 less than P0 plus three. And unless this is kind of uh, how we can have a better way of generalizing the information that we see in a subtree in the symbol execution tree and compute a better quality interplan. By better quality interplan, I mean an interplan which is more general and it can subsume more nodes in the symbol execution tree. Now, uh, let's say this is a good point for me to move into weakest precondition uh, versus strongest post condition uh, and explain a little bit on the background and then go into the, uh, let's say, weakest precondition uh, interpolation. Uh, weakest precondition is the exploration of the program from the bottom to the, onto the top. Let's say we have a formula. We have a safety condition at the end of the program. We want to prove that x is greater than zero at the end of a certain program. We keep that condition and we push it backwards. We are running the program in a reverse way. And we want to see what is the precondition on the top of the program, what is the most general precondition at the top of the program to ensure that x is greater than zero at the end of the program. This is what we would call as the weakest precondition. Weakest precondition is, means the most general precondition at the top of the program, which would ensure the safety of the program. And we have the strongest post condition, which is more or less similar to how we run a program from the beginning, meaning that uh, we limit the program. Let's say we have initially x0 equals to 0. We run the program, and we show 
it at the end of the program that the path is safe. The strongest post condition can be kind of considered as mm, the approach that we use in testing and the approach that we use in normal semantic execution. Now, in TraceRx, we have strongest post condition with interpolation, which this interpolation comes now from the weakest pre condition. And let's see how this can be helpful for us. Uh, sorry, this is again my. Uh, I connect the charger for the laptop. Okay, so uh, actually, weakest precondition is the ideal interval. It means that it gives us the most general formula that we require, and it will allow us to have the uh, best uh, pruning that we want. Unfortunately, because precondition is very difficult to compute, and when we compute it, it's uh, very difficult to check. I will give it, give it to you, and show it to you using this example. This is quite a simple example, three statements increasing the value of x differently. Now, assume a combination of b1, b2, and b3 is unsatisfiable. Then the WP formula would be this huge thing over here. It has a disjunction, it has inference, and this would be very difficult for the uh, SAT and SMP solvers to check. And since we have disjunction in there, and we cannot use the general form of weakest precondition as an interval because it would be very difficult and it would defeat the purpose of pruning. What we would try to do is to have a conjunctive approximation of weakest precondition and use that as an interval. Now, uh, I will show this. This would be kind of uh, the second interpolation algorithm that we have. Instead of using weakest precondition, we approximate the weakest precondition. Now, if you remember, I mentioned we have a path interpolation and we have a tree interpolation. Let me first explain how we compute a path interpolation using, uh, let's say, uh, weakest precondition. There are two possible, uh, we do this in LLVM, uh, at LLVM level, on LLVM IR. So let me explain to you um, how we do it. We can, at that point, we kind of divide the LLVM instructions into two groups. One is the assignment instructions and one is the assume instructions. Assignment instructions are normal instructions that we have, let's say like x equals z plus two. Assume instructions are usually the instructions which come from uh, loop heads or from if statements that we have to deal with them separately. Uh, in the assignment case, usually uh, the inverse transition of the instructions over the post condition formula can be computed. This is not very difficult and we can apply it on at LLVMIR for different instructions. As an example, if the post condition, if our safety condition is x less than or equal to 15, and we have an instruction which has x equals z plus 2, then the weakest precondition would be z less than or equal to 13. So we kind of replaced z plus 2 with x in this formula, then simplified it and got z equals less than or equal to 13. Now, this is the simple part, not very difficult. But when we go to the assume instructions, we have a, let's say, input set of constraints. We have an assume instruction and we have a safety property or a post condition. This is a very difficult problem to solve. It's known as an abduction problem. And there is no general uh, way of solving this problem in, the, in computing the weakest precondition. And what we do is just we find a generalization of the context, the generalization of a C, and replace it with C over here. So we compute the C bar, we replace it over here, and we hope that this uh, formula still holds, and that C bar would be our weakest precondition. Let me show you with an, uh, in more detail, and this is kind of the core of our second interpolation algorithm. We have a set of constraints similar to what we saw in the path constraints in the program. We reach an assume instruction, and we have a set of post condition formulas that we have. Now we have to generalize this part of the formula C1 to Cn to compute the interplan that we want. Uh, this part, 
we kind of uh, divide all the constraints in the path into three groups. One group is target independent, second group is guard independent, third group is the remainder. The target independent, uh, we just remove them, we drop them. Uh, we don't need them, similar to the A and B that we saw in the first example. The second group are guard, in, uh, guard independent, meaning that they are related to the post condition. Let's say in we have in one of these CIs, we have X equals five. In the post condition, we have X less than 100. So we, uh, we change the X equals five on the uh, path constraint to X less than 100, which we see on the omega part. So the action over here is replaced. The third group is the rest of the constraints. These are the constraints which are related to the if statements or the loop heads. We cannot uh, replace them and we cannot remove them without affecting safety. So we just keep it. We don't make, uh, we do not make any changes on them. We also have some uh, additional optional parts, which I will skip. Uh, you can have a look at it in the slides later on yourself. But let me go to an example. Let's say in the symbolic execution tree, a path condition is this formula over here on A, B, C, D, and X. X is used in the if statement, like this X greater than zero and X less than equal to zero. And on the, let's say, the, in the child knows 5A and 5B, these are the conditions that we have to satisfy. These are kind of the path interplans of the subtrees which are coming from below. Now we want to see that how can we generalize this in common context to satisfy these two conditions over here. Now over here, X is the one which is used in the guard, so we cannot do anything on X at the current moment. Let's say we only keep X. But when we go to A, B, C, and D, we can do some stuff. As you can see, B, C, and D are used in the kind of safety properties of the child. So, but uh, A greater than zero is not used over here. So we can easily remove A. A is in the target independent group. The guard independent group contains B equals five, C equals two, and D equals four. We can replace them for, for the left subpath with B less than, uh, less than or equal to 580, and also this formula over here. As you can see, this formula is much more general compared to this one, and it is very important for us. And we keep the one on X. Similarly, we compute another path interplant from the right-hand side, and when we merge them both, we can uh, end up having this formula. And this formula, this tree interplant, is much more general compared to the context, and we can use this to prune much more nodes in the uh, symbolic ex exploration. Now, as you can see over here, this is the one that we got from the left side, this is the one that we got from the right side, and the conjunction of both would be the tree interplant that we have. The addition of the optional algorithm that I had in the previous, uh, let's say, slide which I skipped, can help us to further generalize the condition on X and generalize it from X between minus one to one, to x between minus two and five and still ensure the safety, which I will again skip that part. Now, if I want to go to a full example this time, uh, the program that I showed you before, at this point, using the weakest precondition uh, um, interpolation, we can general, uh, generate these purple color interplants. And when we start exploring by only traversing two paths in the program and pruning the rest of the paths, we are able to prove the program. So instead of exploring eight programs, we are only able to prove the safety of the program by pruning, by uh, exploring two of the paths to the end and the rest of the paths to a middle node. And this would be very helpful when we want to 
uh, reduce the exponential number of paths in the symbolic execution tree. Now, as another example, this one is on again memory safety. Uh, this example tries to show that we can have weakest precondition on, let's say, arrays. This is also a little bit uh, deep, so I will mm, skip it and we can just leave it over here in the slides in case you want to have a look at it later on yourself. Now, back to the big picture, uh, the things that we do, which is different from clean tracer X, and the things that we do, which are similar to clean uh, in the symbolic execution tree. So CLI explores everything, every uh, symbolic execution path one by one, either using DFS approach, random approach, or let's say other exploration approaches. We in TracerX use mostly DFS, which is best for our interpolation algorithm. So we perform the forward symbolic execution uh, to find feasible paths, similar to CLI. And when the path is finished, we start generating interplans in a backward exploration. We then generate the uh, tree interplans and store them in something that we call the subsumption theory. Now, whenever uh, uh, interplant is added to the subsumption table, whenever we visit a sim similar program point, we look into the subsumption table and we try to see if we have visited a similar node before. And if we have visited a similar node and the interplant still holds for this new node that we are, uh, let's say, uh, exploring, we uh, uh, prone that path, and we, uh, let's say, do not continue exploring the subtree below that path, and we assume that we have pruned it, and we continue on. This, our algorithm is unfortunately more heavyweight comparing to Clay because we have to preserve the intermediate execution states. But on the other side, uh, we are able to prune exponentially, so there is pros and cons. And now I would like to go to the, some of some experiments that we have done. We did work on 47 programs in SVComp and Reactive Systems Challenge, RERS. And some of these programs are industrial programs, and they also have been used in testing and verification competitions. We, the programs have different targets, meaning that uh, each target, if it's, if it's reached, Mm, it's either unreachable, meaning that the program is safe, or if it's reached, means that the program has a bug. So in total, we kind of set 5,058 targets in those programs. And we performed two sets of targets. In the first set, we allowed each tool that we have compared with 300 seconds to find to prove either that target is uh, reachable, meaning it's a bug, or prove that it is unreachable, meaning that the program is still safe. In a second experiment, we picked 1,470 of those targets and we called them as hard targets. And then we allowed the different tools to, be, to see if they can prove hard targets or not. These hard targets were the ones where Cle was not able to prove either safe or find the path uh, to that bug in five minutes, meaning that after five minutes, Cle would say, I don't know. And they were also not from a C as a representative of static analysis was not again not able to uh, give a answer if those targets are reachable or not. Meaning that these two tools within let's say five minutes, we're not able to see anything. And we allow each of our tools now this time 10 minutes to be able to find them if these targets are real bugs or not. The results is in this paper, it's on the archive still, and if in case you want to have a more detailed look. Now we compare Tracer A with CLI and with CBMC. CBMC is uh, one of the most famous bounded model checking tools as a representative of static symbolic execution. Uh, in the all target experiments out of the 5,558 targets, TraceX means in 
nearly 26% of the targets, and it loses in 2% of the targets, meaning that in 26% of the targets, it can find them faster than the other tools, or it can prove them either, uh, let's say, it can say that they are unreachable, or find a bug, or they are a bug, meaning that find a path to them, and uh, while the other tools are not able to do that. And in total, TraceX was like 38 times faster than he in exploring all these targets and 170 times faster than CBMC. And as you can see over here, a group of targets were reachable, meaning that they were bugs. Uh, he and TraceX were able to find much more comparing to CBMC. The second group were unreachable ones, meaning that they were not bugs. And again, this time CBMC and TraceX were able to uh, prove more while he was not able to prove some of the bugs are unreachable. And he had a huge amount of timeouts while CBMC and TraceX had less number of timeouts. Moving to the hard targets, uh, this time uh, TraceX won on 4% of the targets and lose on 4% of the targets. And it was much, much faster than Klee and CBMC uh, on Klee and on hard targets versus compared to the all targets. While uh, this time CBMC was, and these targets were quite difficult. So the difference with CBMC has reduced the uh, the speed up. But when we look at the results, P cannot do much. It can only prove a small portion of these targets to be reachable and to prove them as bug. And it gave time out for a large portion of these targets. While CBMC and TraceRx are able to do more, and TraceRx was able to prove a huge part of these difficult targets as unreachable versus CBMC. We should, uh, you should also note that we did experiment with uh, some of the fuzzing tools like AFL and they were quite far and the results were not very good on these hard targets. As a result, we have not brought the results uh, over here. And uh, I would like to finish my talk with some future directions. Uh, we are trying to expand TracerX in these three uh, areas. One is testing, and one area that we have been working on is MCDC testing, uh, which uh, Dr. Kotbali led the research in this part, and the results were published in this year's ISTA conference. And uh, you can have a look at the paper over there. We are also interested in exploring uh, Tracer X for incremental quantitative analysis. This is very important for safety critical uh, programs and proving non functional features of these programs, like WCT analysis, which is important in avionics systems. Uh, we have submitted a paper to PLDI 2022 with some of the explorations over here and hopefully gets accepted. The third part is on combinatorial, combinatorial optimization. And while uh, in combinatorial optimization is quite far from our areas like testing and verification, but the approaches which are used over there uh, are to some extent uh, similar. And we have, been, we have noticed that interpolation and symmetry, if added to TracerX, can be helpful in combinatorial optimization problems. We have a paper which was uh, submitted to CP 2021, but still it's a draft and we have to work more on it. So uh, this is a little bit more detail on how, how we want to use TracerX in quantitative analysis, which would be more or less trying to ensure non safety of non-functional uh, properties on, in embedded systems and IoT devices. Uh, I will skip the detail, and also on the COP, the combinatorial optimization part, you can have a more look, a more look at and the details later on if you were more interested. And uh, as a conclusion, again, uh, thank you very much for inviting me.
It was a pleasure uh, to join uh, this workshop. This is the Tracer X website uh, and GitHub uh, repository address, and these are the papers that I uh, uh, have more details on uh, what I presented today. Thank you very much. I will be more than happy to take questions if there are any. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rasul, for a very, very informative talk uh, you, uh, on uh, dynamic symbolic execution with interpolation. Uh, you covered uh, uh, the static versus dynamic symbolic execution, how to mitigate uh, such complexity, and approximation uh, of a weakest uh, precondition interpolation, and also covered the uh, challenges and uh, future direction, direction for the dynamic symbolic execution with interpolation. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Rasul. Now, uh, uh, it's open for question and answer session. If anybody has any question, uh, please go ahead. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask questions. Yeah, yeah Arpita? Uh, hello, sir. My name is Arpita. I just want to, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, one in one of your slides, maybe it's uh, 17 or 18 slides, you have told that uh, there is a reference of, you have given us the reference of uh, safe memory. I want to ask you that what is safe memory in the program? Uh, it is defined previously or it is a trial error storage? Uh, and if it defined previously, uh, then from which reference we will get the safe memory? Because the, uh, if we provide memories in the system or uh, the program, it will be very much uh, slagging and a uh, very big program. So uh, please tell me about how to fix the safe memory thing in the program. Uh, sure. Thank you very much for a good question. So mm -hmm. if I've understood your question correctly, uh, it's related to this slide. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So in general, when we are when we want to prove a program is safe or not, there are two types of uh, things that we have to check. The first thing is that sometimes we have a post condition. We have a safety property that we want to show a program holds. For that. Let's say we in this example, in this program, we wanted to prove that x is greater than zero. This one is a safety oracle. This is defined by the user or the programmer. Or let's say it's based on the certain criteria in which the software is used. For example, if the software is used in avionics domain, then there are certain, uh, let's say, safety properties that it should hold, and these are defined based on the standards. So these are kind of the cases that is um, added by the program to be checked. But for the case of memory safety, like this example over here, this is something related to the program itself, meaning that this pointer, which is defined over here, this pointer should point to a valid memory address and in, let's say, C programming language. So this pointer, if it's within the range of this allocation, meaning P, uh, the address of P up to the address of P plus five, then it's a valid uh, pointer address. If it's beyond that, it's an invalid pointer. And if you run this program, it would give you a segmentation fault if, let's say, it's trying to access an invalid memory. So this is something that is built in in CLI and TracerX, this memory safety part. And whenever CLI and TracerX have a pointer, uh, let's say, uh, dereferencing in the program, they automatically add some extra code which checks if this kind of memory dereference is a safe memory access. That check would be something like this. So it tries, it looks at the base, let's say, um, allocation of this pointer, which in this case is this P over here, 
and then it tries to see if it's within a safe range or not. And this is not very easy in general. We know that from C programming language that it is quite uh, dynamic and sometimes finding these constraints is not easy. And we leave it to the dynamic execution, meaning that in one path, P might point to array A, in another path, P might point to another array. So we leave it to the dynamic execution, and whenever we reach to that program point, we look into the memory and see, okay, where this P is probably look, uh, pointing to. And if P is pointing to a valid memory address in the memory, then it is safe. If not, it is not safe. So it's uh, quite tricky in terms of the implementation, but more or less this is something that is uh, automatically done at the current moment in key entry settings. I hope this has answered your question. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rasul. Any, anyone? Any other? Anybody? Okay, then uh, thank you, Dr. Rasul. Sure. Uh, thank you again. Uh, you okay, okay, so uh, now we give the five minute break. After that, uh, we start our next uh, speaker. We go for our next speaker, Dr. Sangharatna Godbale, on uh, the topic protecting software vulnerabilities from hackers using fuzzing. So, uh, exactly at uh, 11 25. We'll start the next session. Is it okay, Gurmode, sir? Ah, yes, Pastor, sir, it's fine. Okay. okay. So, and, uh, any thanks, Rasul, to join us. And it's definitely a very difficult time for you because it's midnight there. <laughs> so, thank you. And sorry for it's a pleasure. The convenience uh, like you face. Thank you very much, Rasul. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rasul, we looking forward to you in future yeah. also. So, so uh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would be more than happy to join the events. Uh, thanks a lot. If you don't mind, I would not stay for Dr. Sangu's presentation no, 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 no. since it's past midnight. But okay. it was a pleasure to be here, and hopefully, we can meet in person in yeah, yeah, future yeah, yeah. events. Sure. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night, Rasul. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. We will start in five minutes, Pasa sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>
मु आरो जे दिदि बोले जे कोइ चलती बुआ ओ बहुत करे पुजी आ स्टेकिंग तो now let us uh, start our technical session one guest for this talk ma'am please thank you sir thank you sir and uh, immense pleasure and immense pleasure to introduce dr sandharatna gadwale uh, he did his in mtech he did his in mtech in the year of 2011 and 13 and phd in, from the nit raurkela india he worked as a researcher in from during the he is working on the bounded model checking mutation testing and combinational testing he is interested in using program analytics he is a team member of the tractor x research group welcome sir and over to you thank you uh thank you very much madam for the wonderful introduction and i would like to thank uh, professor santi for the for organizing this conference and to invite me and uh, it's really a great pleasure to be with you all so thank you very much for that so let me say what it is dr bakar uh, just inform me whether it is possible yeah yeah Yes, yes, yes. Okay. In case if something happens, so please ping me. Yeah. Sure. 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 So well, uh, uh, it was uh, a great talk by Dr. Rahul, and he explained about dynamic equality in the future. <coughs> so uh, this is something that is very advanced, yeah. that means that it will be a time to move ahead. Let's move on. So. microphone big big industries they are using such uh, tools like fuzzing or uh, base tool and dynamic symbolic execution base tool for their purposes so whatever we are learning is quite practical if you are able to do you will be able to perform in industrial job as well as for your research 
so from academic only we are able to start with such uh, good techniques okay uh, so this is what my topic protecting software vulnerabilities from hackers using fuzzing so let us see the outline uh, first i will be introducing the topic then i will be explaining about the afl tool that is the state of art tool for fuzzing and some sample runs i will try to make some good interest with respect to different runs and uh, result i will be explaining and uh, some comparison with other tools that like dynamic symbolic execution we uh, discussed uh, dr rasul discuss about that so such results also i am having i will be explaining them and demo i will be giving you okay so now question is what is fuzzing so uh, fuzzing is nothing just one uh, vulnerability analysis okay what do you mean by vulnerability it means you may have some problems in the system and because of that the entire system may get fail okay so that is what the vulnerability and you have to find out those vulnerabilities because if uh, other bad people if they identify such vulnerability so they can exploit them and can make your system down and they can hack okay and this is the reason why hackers are able to uh, do just imagine there must be some loophole in your system or in your application then and only the intruders or the hackers they are finding those loopholes and then attacking okay this is what the problem you take any of the application whether it is facebook whether it is banking application whether it is twitter or any other uh, software if some uh, hackers or intruders they are trying to attack to those application it means there are some problem there are some loopholes that the developers or the testers they miss to work on okay and this is the main problem that actually we are facing at the moment right now we have to see that how this fuzzing is important okay and how it is different from the uh, testing uh, point of view fuzzing is testing but here we will be able to find out that what is the main difference between the, the our traditional testing and the fuzzing okay i will make the comparison also so in fuzzing what we do we try to give some uh let's say abnormal or anomalous test input we are not giving any valid or systematic test input rather we give something bad input so that we want to see whether our system is ready for the bad to bad work or not or worst to worst situation or not okay our application should be that much robust so that whatever the input or whatever the loopholes would be there the system should not get fail or crash that kind of robustness our system should have so to check that whether system is robust or not or the problems are there or not so you have to look into some abnormal test inputs and based on that you are trying to make the system down if you are not able to do with respect to very abnormal test input then definitely your system is becoming very robust but if some random or uh, sorry abnormal input you are going to give and your system is getting down it means your system is not that much strong and you need to work on that what is the problem and you need to fix it so that if you are a good person like uh, in favor of the establishment or in favor of the organization then it is good but what about the other if others are finding those loophole so they may attack or let's say hack the particular system and may exploit the uh, vulnerability okay so this is the point that actually we are doing in the fuzzing application is monitored for any sign of error so what we do of course we are doing the analysis of the system by supplying the uh, abnormal test input we are uh, making this uh, let's say system down so when system will be down then you will see some error or some crash and that is what we have to monitor it and look for the crash this is the uh, like process fuzzing process that how exactly bugs are being found so as you can see here that uh, let's say first you start and then you can see uh, that you are monitoring the target 
target if you know someone liability you need to find out then you are able to see this uh, let's say uh, target okay for example a particular uh, vulnerability if you are aware about it and you want to look at it then you need to target for that okay then to get it you require to generate uh, test inputs in different cycles so this is first cycle that actually we are making and then after that once the first cycle test input you are executing then you need to see whether the target is crashed or not if it is crashed then you just need to store somewhere and that you need to go for the second cycle to check whether other crashes are there or not to do that you require some more test cases and then you are going to the second cycle and the same process you are following that uh, from the first uh, set of test inputs you are doing uh, the fuzzing algorithm then again you are applying the uh, let's say those test cases to the program to find out if any new crashes you are finding or not if it is finding then you are storing it then again you are creating new test cases and so on and once this particular cycle is uh, let's say rotating you will be able to see that it's a forever uh, algorithm like it's not stopping on its own you have to stop by let's say giving some command or manually okay so that is why uh, fuzzing is called as incomplete because it doesn't know about the stopping uh, point okay when it required to be stopped but nowadays people are researching on this point that enough fuzzing like until what point you want to uh, let's say work on so that is what actually uh, uh, right now we have to let's say focus on that one, once uh, like we started our fuzzing and we are looking for some target or let's say crashes so how much uh, let's say crashes or targets we are looking for or how long what is our time budget that actually we are looking for and based on that we can set our stopping criteria once the stopping criterion is met then you can definitely stop the entire fuzzing process so ultimately depends on the like total number of crashes you are looking for or some branch coverage coverage you are looking for or some time budget it is nice oh that is what point Vulnerability discovery is the art. So, see, uh, programming was an art earlier, right? Then it becomes the engineering. So that uh, philosophy, all we know about it. But like finding the uh, bug is not that much easy task. So that definitely requires some extra skills on very good, uh, you know, uh, experience. So pushing software into exploitable states. And predicting the kinds of mistakes engineer will make and quality assurance security teams will miss and making the impossible possible. So see what vulnerability detection is doing. It's not very easy task. You require to identify that because of what you are getting the crash. Okay, because of something you must be getting some crash and that particular thing you need to identify. Secondly, you need to also, uh, let's say, find out who are working in this particular system. They are like quality assurance people, they are security people, they, how such a vulnerabilities got missed. So this is not very easy thing because the application is being developed with respect to some good uh, budget. And based on that, they have... Uh, deployed the application so it should have gone through very rigorous uh, let's say procedure but happens right there are some loopholes so to find that narrow down loophole you require extra effort and it is not that much easy okay that's why it requires you know good skill or good experience this is what sometimes uh, we can uh, feel that this is impossible to find out the vulnerability. What abnormal test input you are looking for? How you will be able to know? And how the vulnerability will be going for the crash? So something happens, then only we are going to, let's say, test. For example, let's say we are, uh, let's say, launching one rocket, okay? And uh, rocket require like billions of uh, money at the moment, right? Billions of USD. Now, if you are... Uh, let's say facing the problem while launching in like one minute it gets crashed what will happen entire one billion will get lost but do you believe that uh, somebody must have 
like uh, made mistake and that is something like very uh, overlooked mistake of course because the crash happened some mi- mistakes actually happened but it has been crossed with several uh, testing phases and the authorities and all they have approved it it means it is not that much you know easy bug okay this may be deep down easy but it is not at high level and it is not like uh, overlooked by everyone it has been overlooked by everyone and how you are going to identify see if something is visible you will be able to get it but if something is not visible how you are going to identify so that is something like impossible thing that you don't see anything okay it's like just you know coin in the like uh, under the sea and you need to take it out okay so it is very difficult to find out so that is the same point we are in the entire system of millions line of code if just one vulnerability is actually causing the crash to find it is very difficult job okay so that's why it is like important to uh, let's say use very smart to smart technique so that you will be able to find out the vulnerability in very early stage okay secondly uh, uh, the example that how you are going to say that your uh, system is color for the white as well as the black hat hackers now defender it means they have benefits of source code access to uh, let's say engineers and uh, like target 100% coverage so broad and shallow testing is common for that and generally need automation to assist so uh, defenders are like good people who are like in favor of the uh, establishment attackers like they have less information so for uh, white hat hacker uh, like they they know about the system so they may get uh, the uh, let's say the code source code tools everything they will be able to get to protect that particular application but attackers uh, like black hat hackers they don't have anything with them just could be uh, let's say uh, available source code which is open source and which is you know which is closed so they may not be able to get it and secondly uh, they may have some uh, let's say uh, information which is something like exploitable so those information they are collected and uh, only need a handful of cross to chain them together with some information that they are going to let's say get and need to find and explore issues without alerting defender so their main purpose is that they want to steal the things they want to hijack the stuff but they do not want uh, the other people like defenders to let know what exactly they are doing okay now researcher so researchers are having both the attributes sometimes they think for their uh, you know goodness that they are uh, not against the uh, let's say establishment sometimes but they are also working for money as well as the fame okay so various motivation money and fame and lots of ethical reporting options via bug bounties and generally want to stay on right side of the law okay so they don't want to break the law okay that is what they are now uh, let's say how attacker plan okay so let's say uh, attacker should get the pro- that then the protocol analysis uh, the attacker will make and that can be done in like uh, three ways like network network vulnerability analysis fuzzing source binary analysis and fuzzing can be done like uh, based on weaponization which is like exploit development and which is coming from like open source research as well as the closed source research okay people that that particular test input is leading to the crash and that is very <coughs> important if any of the generated mutations resulted in a new t- state transition recorded by the instrumentation and mutated output as a new entry in the tree. you understand that 
like uh, if uh, you are finding something new and which is already not covered earlier then definitely it is becoming a new test input in the queue and then you need to go back to the second step and this is what the next cycle you need to make third cycle fourth cycle fifth cycle and so on the discover test cases are also periodically curled to eliminate ones that have been obsoleted by newer and cycle based okay so afl installation it is very easy uh, you will be able to let's say download the word uh, let's say let's say the the slide i will be supplying so that you can able to uh, follow these steps you may have seen that the second is you need to build so okay. first you need to untar it and then you need to go inside the afl folder and then you need to uh, write the command name okay to build the qemu more this step need to be followed okay you need to go inside the uh, let's say uh, extracted folder and then you need to install uh, this important stuff okay and then run this uh, shell script and then qemu more will also be then finally you need to install uh, the cdf uh, to sudo make install the qemu and it will be uh, able to install on your machine then finally uh, you can make a path test now uh, it is important that whether you are able to run afl or not so initially you will be able to get some issues what are those issues uh, so uh, you need to set up the core file for example okay so uh, for uh, setting up the core file you need to go into the system files inside the kernel uh, folder you will get core pattern one uh, text file is there core pattern so there you need to write core core word you need to write okay so that this particular thing can be uh, let's say handled okay so that is what core dumps so uh, also you require to find out the hang cases where you can see that sending crash notification to external uh, utilities creates a significant delay between the actual crash and having this information relate to afl okay which may misinterpret cache as hang so the test input which are neither crash nor uh, let's say test case so they are like hang also there may be some issues with the or let's say imperfection with respect to your kernel and uh, it can miss the short lived process spawned by afl first so in that particular situation you require to fine tune your cpu frequency and to do that you require to uh, go into the cpu folder inside the system and devices uh, folders and need to apply this eco performance and this uh, scaling governor file you need to uh, set okay uh, go back to original state by replacing performance with on demand or power save so this scaling available governors also you need to see so these are some mandatory steps that you need to perform for the very first time and whenever you reboot your machine okay i will explain you that also but the slides are with you and you can definitely play with it at any time now seeding as i said that you require something to kick start with the let's say process right the fuzzing process requires something so uh, now now you will be able to uh, let's say um, find out that one test at least one test uh, input should be supplied so that fuzzing can be started so how to do that there will be a folder uh, like any name you can give let's say test case name inside that you create one text file okay called as test1.txt or c.txt whatever okay and enter some meaningful information this is really very difficult to say that which is good seed or bad seed okay you never know about it so the huge research is also going on i will explain you one situation so what happens if in your program you have like three uh, let's say user defined integers so in the test file you require three lines with integers 
okay so it says that the first integer is for the first scanner the second is for the second scanner the third is for the third scanner like that now compile and run so compiling you have a source code okay but compile time it will make the binary okay so ultimately you have binary with you right for afl run so for compiling you require to use this command okay in the first block and the second block is to run the uh, let's say afl so as you can see here that afl first minus i and test case so test case is a folder where you have kept these seeds okay minus o results it means whatever you are going to run so those things you are going to store in the result folder and then executable that is test instructor that you are going to let's say supply okay and uh, then you are running it okay so now let us consider one uh, program okay and we will see what result we are having everything i will reproduce in afl okay just shortly we will traverse these particular slides and we will come back to the demonstration so consider this is a program here you can see there are two if statement okay the first if statement is uh, having one condition the second statement is having like condition buffer of zero equal to equal to zero and inside the if statement you are having a target that is assert zero that's it now we need to uh, give so what is that assert zero let me tell you one thing so assert zero is one artificial uh, let's say bug that is what uh, used by the program analysis and software testing people for their analysis purposes. So ultimately this SR0 is uh, like defined in macro where it shows that to halt once you are having something or it's not halt, it is just trying to uh, highlight that you have reached that particular point. Okay. So ultimately we are actually looking for assertion violation. So SR0 is a bug and that is inside the if statement so reachability uh, things we have to find out here so if sr0 is reachable and if we able to get the error assertion violation happen so for this you should be knowing that it should be buffer of zero is equal to zero so whenever this true path will be there then and only you will be able to get the sr0 now uh, seed you need to provide to the uh, let's say afl so the seed is 10101 10, okay so this is the seed we are providing and this is the program test instruction dot c right this is the uh, monitor uh, in the initial slide i actually explained you that uh, you have uh, like you know um, target the so target is sr0 but you need to monitor that target. It means whether the target has been found or not found. So that actually you need to identify. So you can observe here, there are different uh, metrics and the parameters that shows the analysis report. For example, the left hand side, the first uh, block, which says process timing. So this timing is showing about the runtime, uh, last new path, last unique crash, last unique hang and etc. Second is cycle progress. So whether uh, like now processing paths, time out, etc. That information you are having. Stage progress, like what strategy you are applying now. Stage execution, total execution, execution speed. Then fuzzing strategy yields. So there may be some uh, fuzzing strategy, for example, bit flips, byte flips, arithmetic, known integer, dictionary, havoc, and trim. So bit flips. So see, what do you mean by mutation? If in uh, like simple word, if I will ask you, then what do you understand? Let us consider our COVID case. Currently, like very bad situation we are having, COVID situation. In COVID situation, why we are worrying now? Because the very first COVID type that was with some sequence, okay? 
now people are saying covid new variant sometime it is called as chinese variant uk variant us variant african variant some uh, like that the people are saying that is wrong okay means based on the country you should not say but there are some technical uh, sequence or medical sequence but people they don't understand that's why the virus is coming from the this country so just name it so uh, our intention is not that but a variant is different from the older one it means the sequence gets changed as compared to the uh, let's say uh, let's say the existing one so somewhere somehow a change happens from the original one okay so that change is nothing but the mutant that's why you must be uh, let's say hearing the word uh, mutating so the virus is getting mutating so mutating in what sense in the sequence that that definitely that uh, uh, let's say that virus may have that sequence is getting changed so this is something like different uh, type or that is different type and that those types you are trying to make with respect to the mutant the same way you have some values for example you have 10101 okay now we need to uh, mutate it how you are going to mutate so based on bit flips okay so bit flip means we take a bit and then we change it for example 10101 it represent one number if i will change the last bit here and it will become 10100 and it becomes another number and that is nothing but your new test case could be possible that test case may lead to crash who knows but the based on bit flip you can do that okay then wherever you have zero you can make it one you can either change one bit you can change multiple bits never mind you will get different uh, meaningful test input if they are not meaningful you need to discard them secondly byte flip so one byte is equal to eight bits so at a time you are changing the set of eight bits at a time and that is called as byte flip arithmetic so arithmetic means what we have plus minus multiplication division mod such operations we are having so if we have some numbers and based on that numbers if we apply some arithmetic operators and after making some arithmetic calculation if some new test input will get generated so those test input may be useful and those test cases could lead to crash and that's why you are required arithmetic um, strategy no integers some way somehow you are um, completely aware about the integers uh, okay and those integers directly you are taking some are dictionary so some numbers you are making and stored okay from the previous learning okay you have trim it means you are cutting down with respect to the size with respect to the memory and so on so all these things are important to make or to mutate the existing test input so that new test cases can be generated and those test cases are leading to higher branch coverage or let's say the unrevealed crash can be revealed now coming to the right side you have overall result overall result is like a matrix that you are looking for uh, like you are program from the fuzzer it says that cycle done how many cycles done within that particular span of time like in 1 minute 4 seconds this green color 1 4 3 5 cycles have been finished and you can estimate the speed of that how many paths covered only one so it's there in the like you know loop and that particular is not getting come out then uh, how many crashes you found one crash how many hangs zero hangs so all this information you are making right in map coverage you have map density count coverage then in finding in depth you have favored path new edges total crashes total uh, time out uh, let's say time outs then path geometry you have labels pending pending favor 
own finds, imported, stability, etc. And what is the usage of the CPU also? For example, for this particular program, it is 57%. Okay. Now, as I said that uh, AFL is not uh, finishing on its own. It's incomplete, uh, let's say, uh, technique. So in that situation, you should be ready to use control plus C as the killing command to kill the process or you require to provide timeout of certain amount like uh, time uh, so let's say number like 300 second 60 second one hour 10 hour like that now it depends on the stopping criteria like enough fuzzing if you have done so you can apply for example if you are saying that some coverage you wanted to achieve for example 85 percent coverage you achieve for the program so you stop at that point so that is what enough coverage is fine crashes form if you are looking for five crashes and all five crashes have been formed then that is done okay and based on that like time also if you have one hour of time and you are giving it then you can stop storing result the newly discovered path or mutated uh, valid test cases are saved in folder that is result queue this is what actually i was saying you the test cases you are making and those test cases you are uh, like you know uh, uh, creating and those test cases are inside the result folder the hang test cases are saved in results hang so this hang uh, folder are inside the let's say result folder and this hang uh, as I said that because of delay in the you know, uh, you know the confirmation that uh, whether it is crash or not so that because of that it is not completely considered as the hang or it is not like a, a normal test input so it is in between so this is called as hash and if uh, let's say test input is finding the crash so that is also uh, considered and it is shifted to the crash folder. Okay, so that was the first program. The second program is uh, there's a trial one dot C program that I will also explain to you. Okay, so here what actually we can see means how exactly uh, the fuzzing can be used. That's what actually I'm trying to explain to you. For example, if I want to go for a path uh, sensitive, let's say coverage. So here you can see that uh, like if I want to see whether it has covered the uh, true branch of x uh, true branch of a is greater than 5 and true branch of b is equal to 100 so this true and true i want to find out so i can find out in this way after injecting kappa plus plus kappa plus plus in both the blocks a is greater than 5 and b is equal to 100 once this particular combination is made so I can say that I have covered the path true and true. Just you can observe that there are two atomic conditions here and one inside other. How many paths can be there? That will be three paths. One is true and true. The second one is true and false. And the third one is false, don't care. Okay. So don't care means if the A is greater than five is false, then you are now, uh, you're not uh, allowed to get into the then body. Okay, so B is zero and SF zero is nothing but the assertion violation happens. So it means once the assertion violation happens for any test input that is actually crossing this particular line. So this is also important for us that to how the sequences we are able to make or the locality of the uh, blocks we are able to make so like that. How to do? So you can see that we require we have two variables here, a and b, and uh, a is equal to two, b is equal to ninety-five, and now we need to run it. Now the question is that how much difficult it is to get it? How much difficult? So when it comes to b is equal to hundred, what is the possibility from the test input I am giving? and uh, if it is not 100 if it is something else so what is that and how that particular number is leading to equal to 100 because the equality requires b equal to 100 for sure okay if it is not then it never will get succeeded 
so from 2 to the power 32 test input space from there you require one value and that is 100 how exactly you are going to do that it's very difficult right so uh, this is the proof and i will i will play also that if i supply a is equal to 2 b is equal to 95 in that situation i might not get the error in like 5 minutes also okay why because uh, b is equal to 100 is required but in my test seed i have given 95 okay so from 95 to 100 it is it is taking huge time or let's say the fuzzing is not able to do okay and you can consider that this particular seed is not in favor of the execution okay what we supposed to do we supposed to change the seed and now seed you can just change to let's say a is equal to 6 and b is equal to 102 you quickly see that in 4 seconds you are finding the crash that is uh, like very fast 4 seconds versus 5 minutes only with respect to the data or seed you are giving this is huge difference okay we will prove it also so from here the logic comes of so, uh, like good seed what do you mean by good seed okay so the random values provided as seed test case into afl which easily finds bug or generates new test cases or achieves maximum code coverage faster is called as good seed ultimately we have to provide seed which are better so that the crash can be found early or higher coverage can be found okay or computed with respect to the fuzzing that is nothing but the good seed now for example in this particular program seed value is a is equal to 6 and b is equal to 102 that is called as good seed because in four seconds we got the same crash for the same program but in 2 and 95 we haven't and that is what the main problem here it requires good understanding of the program structure so you see here i have given the understand like i have given the uh, test input uh, let's say seed by looking at that okay there are only two uh, let's say condition one condition i can make it easily to six because a is greater than five will become uh, let's say true for the first instant instead which require uh, like not to change anything else Secondly, B is equal to 100. If I'll give like 100 to, so it can replace the value of uh, like, uh, you know, 102 to 100 or uh, let's say minus 2, some way, somehow it will be able to uh, make it. And it is actually happening also. I will explain. Now, the second program that is trial2.c. In this particular program, uh, like this program is by the way very big program like 1700 line of code and uh, like uh, here I am targeting to check whether the uh, block on top and block at bottom whether they are able to cover at the same point of time or not. So this is also one thing I need to check. Okay, so here uh, what actually I am observing that it is very quickly it is finding in 47 seconds itself it is finding okay so this is also one important uh, uh, let's say uh, important uh, feature for afl that even though your uh, let's say uh, block is on top and one block is in middle okay ne never mind but you have the marking and based on that marking you are able to find that okay that particular block and this block got me but this is like search space you are making and if you want to go to like uh, if you want to go to the uh, search space in a very uh, like uh, this way like you know uh, entire execution tree you are going to explore it is something like very huge search space and here you may not be able to find it that way. now the main is mcdc coverage that also dr basa explained during the um let's say introduction that mcdc testing is one of the topic it's practical even rasul also highlighted about mcdc and hopefully professor uh, mohapatha sir will come in afternoon he will also a little bit brief about mcdc 
so uh, myself and um, professor mahapatra and uh, rasul uh, we were working in mcdc since a long time okay myself like since a decade i'm working in this particular domain in mcdc okay and it's very practical i have seen several different uh, like technique and we have like developed uh, several uh, technique and uh, my associated uh, like uh, researcher ms arpita datta she also worked in this uh, area a lot and uh, her masters and uh, in phd she worked for fault localization but now she joined uh, like nus singapore as postdoc and there also she is contributing in this domain also so this is what uh, like uh, in a team we were working on this particular direction in mcdc right so uh, i wanted to say that mcdc is practical whenever people uh, let's say they go for uh, launching the software like for aircraft or let's say missiles and all so they definitely uh, like you know uh, uh, try to approve these applications okay and without that they may not be able to approve it so approval means there is a board they have to verify okay whether uh, the application is meeting mcdc requirement or not okay and if it is yes then and only they will launch it otherwise they will not okay so it is mandatory to have level a certification as per the avionics domain so now uh, you know safety critical application so you have medical domain you have aircraft you have like banking sectors and so on okay so everywhere uh, the criticality is there so when criticality comes so human lives are involved uh, let's say with the application for example let us say one aircraft okay so in aircraft there are several software for example uh, the uh, let's say the media player uh, control the software controlling the media player software controlling the buttons like uh, turn on fan turn on or let's say lights or calling a crew member okay and uh, there may be uh, let's say uh, one software which is controlling some of the important features of the aircraft and there may be one software which is autopilot that we know which is controlling the entire aircraft okay and there may be one software which is communicating to atc so all these softwares are important now you need to decide which softwares are important for example uh, communication to atc is definitely important okay communication to crew members also important and uh, let's say uh, controlling the entire aircraft is most important controlling some features like displaying the fuel or displaying the wind temperature all this less important control uh, let's say uh, controlling the fan light less important calling to crew members customer like passenger will call crew members less important media player less important so these are the hierarchies of the applications level a should come for the uh, software which is controlling the entire aircraft because if that aircraft if that software gets fail entire aircraft will get uh, let's say crash and all human lives okay passengers and uh, crew members on board like 300 plus all will die at the same time it's very critical 300 life money is different thing but life lives are important with safety critical application and to make it sure that level a certification is done for such application you require mcdc as per the standards and you need to focus on this so that makes mcdc important but the question is that whether there are existing tools for mcdc answer is yes but there are several varieties of issues with uh, the existing tools they are like commercialized of course and uh, some of they are not following some techniques um, their efficiency and open source is of course not uh, much we are very less, less uh, open source tools okay but uh, 
there may be some upcoming tools that people can make for mcdc and people can use it okay so for example uh, like if i want to make mcdc tool with respect to this fuzzing the same thing can be done with dynamic symbolic execution that dr rasul was saying about it okay that how we made tracer x enable with mcdc so this is one example that we can make it for example you can see that if this is the predicate okay then the sequences that are important for mcdc we are actually making here right and uh, for this particular predicate the sequences we are making here so such uh, sequences we are annotating in this particular program and this program will supply to the afl to show whether the condition written inside the assert is uh, let's say true or false and that answer actually uh, afl will give us you can see here uh, we need to supply some values for the variables and based on that we are finding out the uh, let's say the crashes here so there are three unique crashes found out of eight so this is what some percentage we can find out like in transmitter proof okay and uh, like uh, if you can see that uh, dr rasul uh, like mentioned about tracer x that is dynamic symbolic execution with pruning okay that is also our tool that i am working on that particular tool along with uh, rasul and uh, cli is the state of art where tracer x is built on top of cli and afl that actually i explained in my talk and i will give the demo as well and cbmc we have not covered this is bounded model checking another state of art tool so all these four are the state of art tools for their own uh, like domain for example afl is for <coughs> fuzzing a uh, cli is for dynamic symbolic execution cbmc is for bounded model checking and tracer is for dynamic symbolic execution with interpolation okay and uh, some programs we ran and you can see there were 100 targets and afl is not finishing on its own so it's like infinite time we made but this is time out of 1 hour and uh, td is your target detected and execution happens and path uh, con conditions this is the time that actually execution time we made so you can see some of the programs got finished earlier and these are the detected targets cbmc is also finishing on some of the programs and for some of the program it is not finished and for tracer x most of the programs got finished and some of the programs not and these are the detected targets so these are the result and we will be able to observe that most of the time tracer x has the best result okay and uh, like we can show that afl can handle like 18 to 20 decisions in the program in a better way cli can handle 24 decisions and cbmc can handle 35 decisions but tracer x can handle uh, like 1000 plus decisions in better way okay so uh, not I, I will i will explain you all the programs dr basar can i have 10 more minutes please hello Okay, so um, I will just require 10 more minutes. No, uh, Dr. Godbole, you can uh, take uh, some more uh, time, no problem. You can okay. take uh, half an hour, it's okay. Because not, Durga not sir is... Uh, not yeah. half an hour, but uh, 10 to 15 minutes, okay? Okay, okay, no problem. Followed by it. question and answers. Yeah, yeah, okay, no problem. So just confirm me, uh, my, uh, let's say these are visible or not. Mm. My virtual machine is visible or not? Just confirm me, okay? Okay, okay. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah.
Ok. Okay. Uh, Dr. Basa, can you please confirm if both my like PDF as well as uh, virtual machines are visible? Uh, I don't think the PDF is visible. I think uh, only. No, no, not at a time, but whenever I'm clicking on it. it is okay, appearing. okay. It is appearing, right? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And the font is also okay for this script? Like, yes, yes, yes. Okay, very good. Yes. Okay, so dear participants, uh, let us now understand the uh, like use of AFL. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, that uh, like, you know, uh, for uh, the CPU, the stuff that I will be able to show you once I will get the errors for that. Otherwise, by default, you need to do. So, already I assume that my system has the installed AFL and then uh, I will go ahead. So, I will show you from the compile and run, okay, for the programs. All the programs I will rerun, okay. So, here you can see that this is the program that we were testing, okay. So, this is the program, right. You can see. And you can see that assert zero is inside the if statement here. Okay, assert zero is inside that. It means this particular uh, if condition should be true so that I can fire this assert zero here. Okay, so to do that, I require to compile the thing. So I have a script that definitely can be can be used, but I will be uh, let's say running command by command so that I can explain about the command type also. So let's say AFL GCC. Okay, so here uh, we need to give the, uh, let's say, uh, test, uh, what is the program name, test instruct, okay, dot C, test, so here, uh, let's say, here you can see, that this is the AFL GCC, which is the compiler for AFL. And these are some commands that actually require to use. And this is the source code that actually we are testing. And this is the executable that we are making. Okay. Now instrumentation happened. What do you mean by instrumentation? So AFL has its own understanding to analyze the program. So what it does, it injects some of the marks and Based on those marking, uh, AFL will try to reach out those points and then to prove that whether it is, uh, let's say, able to meet that requirement or not. That is what the instrumentation. So once we have this source code, we instrument it. And instrumentation is no, nothing but you are, uh, let's say, uh, compiling. Okay. Now, uh, here you can see that you have this one running it. So, test instruction is 
yeah now uh, you see uh, we as i already explained you that um, uh, let's say afl doesn't finish on its own so we require to give the time budget right so this is what uh, time out we are giving so 65 means 65 seconds we want to give so 5 minutes required to wind up the thing that's why 5 minutes extra i am giving usually so it will stop in 60 second itself okay so afl first is the executable that actually running the command okay and then minus i is the input that actually you are giving so here you can see test case random is the folder name so where is test case random here in the directory so you can see test case random here and if you remember i was explaining you that you require to give one seed for the program okay so uh, for this particular program let us give one seed and one seed we can give 10101 whatever the there in the slide 10101 okay like that okay and for this particular program now uh, this test case random has the one file that is ac.txt which has value 10101 okay minus o is nothing but results afl test instruction the program name that actually I'm giving here okay so one folder will be uh, let's say created and inside that you will be able to get all the information and this is the executable test instruction okay so let us run this now and it will show complaint because i have rebooted the machine so we need to fix that so that is something like cpu frequency issue this one so what is the problem here we need to go to the core pattern in the system file and then we need to uh, let's say check it once more okay so core pattern we need to go Oops, sorry since it is system file you need to be uh, you need to use sudo and any editor whatever you like so here you can give core okay as per the instruction in, in given in the slide I, as i said that you require core so just i have added the core word here okay now i will go back to the command i will run it you see it is running now it is running and it is already found it the crash what actually we are looking for it already found in one second itself understood so this is the way how we compile and run the program and uh, since we were looking for the sr0 as the uh, crash so this one unique red crash will show that particular point okay that crash has been already found okay and uh, since uh, our result folder is here result afl test instruction so all the information is being saved here so if you remember i was explaining you about the uh, like compartments three compartments were there so the first compartment is the queue where you are bringing the values from the seed okay so to make it streaming and all other stuff like in a seed it was 10101 when it got uh, shifted to the queue so it got trimmed and now it is 1010 so the last bit is got truncated okay and based on that it is finding the uh, let's say it is finding the uh, let's say crash and since the crash is already been found so crash has been found with respect to this particular uh, let's say uh, trimming okay so this is something like uh, uh, created from the seed and bit flip happened so bit flip happened for the first bit so the first bit one got uh, zero and it becomes another uh, test case okay and that test case is leading to crash Okay, so this is what real example that actually wanted to show you. And now, uh, hang is nothing because uh, we don't have any such situation that uh, is making delay. Okay, 
so uh, whether it finishes yeah it already finished in uh, like one minute you see one minute it got finished okay now uh, for the statistic so here like the time stamp that you are making when you start when you finish how many cycles done execution done execution per seconds total path okay and so on all this information and what was the command line that actually used that also you are uh, writing here okay and this is the plot data so with respect to each time stamp what are the parameters they are getting updated that actually you are making so that based on that you can plot the diagram for your papers and the presentations okay so hope this is understood that this particular program now let us go for the next uh, uh, let's say uh, program for the next program i have trial1.c in that trial1.c we have two kappas so for example this one uh, kappa plus plus kappa plus plus okay and this is the safety condition kappa is less than 2 okay so 2 is less than 2 it is uh, like making the false okay so let us see whether it is uh, finding it or not uh, but what seed actually we need to give that actually we have to see uh, see here uh, random yeah this one okay so here uh, from the slide 2 and 95 okay so I should give 2 and 95 okay try 1.c and uh, 2 and 95 i have given here i need to compile it now okay uh, first of all let me see if any executable already there or not i should delete yeah there are so i will delete all these things okay these are the executable from past yeah delete it so new uh, i will create so here you can see trial one. Yeah. Okay. Everything is set now. The executable we compile, uh, the source code we compile to executable, and that executable we are giving it to AFL first. And random is already there, and the seed we are provided 295. And uh, test and uh, the result will be saved here in trial one. Okay, so I think all set. Let us see now. We will wait for one minute, and according to my understanding, uh, we will be not able to get the crash according to my understanding but it is fuzzing if it does some good algorithm in between like one minute may may be found but uh, as per my you know analysis and my experience it is difficult to uh, get the crash in one minute because the search space is huge and you require one value from the entire space and that getting the value uh, is uh, probability is very less okay so yeah fifty second crossed finish not found okay so this is what i wanted to say here so see here also we have not found but we have gone for five minutes earlier but right now just one minute because to save our time okay so uh, ultimately the uh, let's say um, the the bug is not been found that is what my point is so i will just make it as run one okay so you can see uh, it created uh, two test cases no crash found so empty no hang found so empty okay yeah now uh, as per the slides as you can see i need to just change to something like 100 to or 6 okay so just uh, changing the seed nothing else i will not do anything else so 6 and 102 
okay now i need to run it same same program i need to run with different uh, seed okay and now we will see as per my understanding as per my experience it will uh, it will find uh, like quite early let's see Six, seven, eight. Eight second, we found it. You can see exactly at eight second, we got the result. This is what my understanding, and this is what actually I'm saying. Very fast. What we did? Just we have made different values to the seed, and that is called as good seed. And that seed actually we have given. It already found it. Okay, still it is running because I am not killing. I have given time measure of one minute. That's it. I can exit on error also, but just I want to show it. It's very fast. We 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 waited for one minute and here eight second. Even you consider this execution, it is too huge. Five times six times faster, right? Now let's go for trial two. Trial two is uh, quite a big program. uh trial 2 this is the big program okay so here it is 1700 line of code okay and this is from a uh, reactive system program so uh say 1700 and also the bound is 5 so you can imagine that the execution tree will become very uh, big but here we can see that assert kappa is less than 2 okay so the the safety system we have to give now uh, kappa plus plus so these are the two places where we are injecting or we are looking for the block for example at line number 1403 secondly line number 1602 it means there is a gap of 200 and 300 line of code it's very big so to do that what actually it requires it requires to satisfy this if statement then increment it this uh, uh, predicate and then increment it it is very difficult you know very difficult but it does fuzzing can uh, do this thing okay and that is what we can say the path sensitive uh, coverage that we are looking for okay so uh, let us run this one trial 2 okay but what was the uh, seed uh, we have given 1001 okay let us go back to the seeds and we will just change it to 1001 okay yeah now i, I will run this like trial to trial to like this okay so as per my understanding and as per the like uh, result on slide we got in 47 second so let us see whether we get it or not Twenty-three seconds. Also, you see the CPU usage crossing three hundred percentage. Also, so forty-seven, forty-eight. So it has not found yet. Let us wait for ten seconds. Otherwise, we will go for. Two minutes. So this is the way how you should increase the time budget also if you are not finding in the particular allocated time. Okay. So let's say uh, increase this for something like one twenty-five means two minutes.
Okay, just a minute. I think I need to clean this one. Oops, just a minute. Spelling mistake, huh? Let us wait for two minutes. Hopefully, it should found fine because in my previous run it found in uh, 47 seconds my seats are also same so hopefully it should find This is the way how you increase the time budget if you are given uh, some time budget and you are not meeting the required thing okay then you can increase it like that Okay, so let us wait for uh, like uh, 30 more seconds. If it is not found, uh, yeah, it found, it found. Okay, it found. So this is what actually, and both are same. You, know, you should not worry that two units, there were only one crash only, but it is finding from two different paths. Okay, but it found in one minute 20 seconds. That is what actually I was saying. Just after uh, increasing the time budget, it can. And it is okay. Like uh, sometimes we are running on good computer, Sometimes we are running on virtual machine and it depends on that. Okay. So all these things are, you know, same. So do not worry at all for all these things. Okay. Now, uh, like running trial 3.c where we have uh, like eight targets out of eight targets, how many targets we've got and based on that we can uh, decide, right? So let us uh, change the like seeds value. So it was something like five. 500 to 55, 100 to 55, 9988, 9988, triple one. Okay. So uh, this is trial three. So let us run trial three. Trial three. Dot C and executable. So, okay. Instrumented properly. And uh, three, three, correct. Here it is asking for some issues where it says that the test uh, input leading to the crash. So in that situation, AFL first go to help. So what it says that you have some options where if the uh, crash exploration mode which says that if your, uh, let's say, test input is leading to the crash, then you can use minus C and then definitely it will run. So I need to add one command uh, option that is minus C so that if crash is happening, still it will continue to run. It found. It found in one unit. But there are uh, some other assertions. Second and third and so on okay so in one minute we will see how many we got So in my slides, 
there are three unique crashes. So here two unique crashes. It depends. Again, it could be slow, so we may get slower. Okay, so if we increase the time budget like one minute, ten minutes, or twenty, definitely the numbers will get increased. Okay, so uh, this is what uh, I wanted to explain, and I already explained about this analysis. Thank you very much uh, uh, for listening to me, and definitely I'm happy here now to take some questions if you have. Yeah, Doctor Basa, you may uh, proceed. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Doctor Godbole. It's a tremendous. Talk and uh, full of uh, practical, and uh, I think uh, it will definitely help the researchers who are keen interest towards uh, this area. So may, may I uh, now open for question? So anybody, I think uh, one question is there. Yeah. Or uh, do AFL work on data insufficient input? Data insufficient inputs. Yes. Can you elaborate? Ask or to unmute and ask. Miss, I require some more uh, uh, detailed question. Miss, what do you mean by data insufficient inputs? Arpita, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions directly. Yeah. Participant who asked the question, uh. you can unmute and. Uh, Arpita, ask. you unmute yourself first. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Thank you, sir, for taking my question. Uh, my question is, uh, I mean, that fuzzy and specifically AFL, how it work on, uh, there are different unstructured data we have to work for uh, sometimes. Uh, there are many data insufficient, then we have to recognize it with some specific pattern and then structured and then work off for the further process. So uh, my question is that there are some data we get which changes its frequency very frequently. And there are some data which are not properly structured. And there are some uh, unorganized, uneven data. So working on those data, how I proceed with AFL? Uh, OK, see. So here data means the test inputs that we are looking for the analysis of the program. OK, so let us very clear with that. Data means test input. Okay, so of course uh, we do not have uh, like uh, all sufficient test inputs. So of course it is working on the insufficient test input, and we require it to make it sufficient so that we will be able to get all possible crashes and uh, maximum, let's say, path coverage or branch coverage like that. Okay, so definitely it is working on the insufficient test input, but it should start with at least one test input so that it will start working and as you said correctly it is working on the uh, like you know it is working based on the strategies that actually we are having and it makes uh, let's say it takes some good test input discard some bad test input it trims it it makes it in a proper structure and then making use of it to find the crash so the answer is yes, it is working on data insufficient input if you are uh, like asking in this term. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your question. Anybody else? Any other questions? Any other question? Oh, uh, Dr. Godbole, is it uh, the AFL is open source or uh, say license? Completely open source and okay. since like 20 years people are using and uh, you know uh, now like 30 more contributors are there and okay. it's a real time tool that uh, Facebook, Google and Microsoft, these big companies, they are using it. Okay, so this is really very important tool. That's why I took this topic so that whoever are willing to go to industry or do research, they can definitely take the advantage of my talk. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, uh, what I uh, want that uh, next time, uh, let us go for a hands-on training so sure. that uh, uh, students or researchers can and worthy with these tools. So, it's benefit for them. So, uh, uh, I hope I do, we don't have any more questions. So, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Gurbole. It's a very, very beautiful and informative talk. Uh, uh, for the researchers and the students uh, uh, from academia. Uh, so uh, definitely we'll uh, 
looking forward to you in the near future so hopefully you will uh, accept our invitation in future if you have uh, any more uh, number of conferences like this with hands on practices so thank you again thank you very much forgot bole thank you so uh, uh, in the next uh, second session we now we are launch break uh, uh, from uh, 115 to 155 pm so in the technical session 2 we have two talks uh, first one uh, by professor dp mahapatra uh, the topic is recent advances in software testing methodologies which is a very very fundamental one and uh, uh, it's very very beneficial for the pg students as well as the, the upcoming researchers and the next uh, topic uh, next talk is by dr adam and the topic is improving software processes and doing research at the same time it's also a very very uh, beneficial talk very very brief uh, fundamental talk so so we'll meet again at 1:55 pm sharp so please do join and uh, enjoy both the talks thank you thank you very much thank you bye bye dr godbale thank you thank you very much see you Uh, sorry sorry uh, just a announcement uh, actually professor Dur durga prasad mahapatra sir uh, told me that uh, we will start uh, the talk uh, instead of 2 pm at uh, 2:30 pm so we'll start the next talk uh, at 2:30 uh, uh, so everybody will join at 2:25 uh, pm he has some Uh, important assignment so is uh, noble to join at uh, 2 pm so we'll start our next talk at uh, 225 pm instead of 155 we'll start at 225 thank you thank you so we can now leave leave and we'll join at 225 pm so god will sir if uh, you are comfortable then you can also join at the time sure sure i will be there Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And give some break to participate also. Like one hour is sufficient, uh, like uh, for lunch break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two p.m. may not be. Yeah. So that is fine. Yes. 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 Thank you.